An overachiever is defined as one who performs better or achieves more than what is generally expected of them, often because of high ambition, pressure from family, etc. etc. If I had to use just one word to describe Future Redeemed, it would be overachiever. Is that all of it then? We done? No more little secrets? It's the unvarnished truth. Future Redeemed is more than the culmination of Monolith Soft's 15 years of developing the Xenoblade series, doubling as the culmination of series creator Tetsuya Takahashi's ambition that began with Xenogears nearly 30 years ago. On that token, Future Redeemed goes beyond just being an expertly crafted conclusion to the Xenoblade series, marking a truly incredible creative achievement that very few other series could lay claim to. On the surface, Future Redeemed doesn't even seem that different from what Torna the Golden Country was for Xenoblade 2. Both Torna and Future Redeemed serve as prequels to their respective games, further fleshing out the narrative and reworking the battle system to be more kinetic, offering an experience that borders on being a complete video game in its own right, rather than a simple DLC expansion. The key difference here is that Future Redeemed had much more to accomplish than what Torna did. While Torna was originally meant to be a part of Xenoblade 2 that ended up being cut from the final game, the 11th hour decision to make the Xenoblade 2 expansion pass gave Monolith Soft the chance to revisit and retool the story into a standalone campaign. And even then, Xenoblade 2 still works as a standalone narrative even without Torna's existence. The extra detail shown in Torna unquestionably layers the events of Xenoblade 2 with new context that elevates the overall experience, but there weren't any leftover questions or gaps in the story that necessitated Torna's existence, unlike Xenoblade 3. While the core of Xenoblade 3's story still works on its own, it's hard to shake the feeling that specific details were intentionally kept vague or otherwise omitted entirely. Whether it relates to elements introduced in prior games or even details introduced in Xenoblade 3 itself, there was always a sense that the game needed something extra to fill in the blanks. Between the success of Xenoblade 2 and Nintendo's heavier focus on post-launch DLC for their Switch releases, one can only surmise that Monolith Soft wrote Xenoblade 3 around the idea of an expansion pass. Overall, Xenoblade 3 feels as though it was written with a similar approach to Takahashi's prior work on both Xenogears and Xenosaga. Create an expansive, complex story that spans thousands of years, but leave a couple gaps in the chronology that could still be explored in future installments. It's a fairly ambitious approach that, along with many other factors, ultimately led to Takahashi's visions for those games being infamously compromised. However, unlike with Squaresoft and Namco, Nintendo was actually willing to give Takahashi the time and money to finally let him cook, circling us all the way back to Future Redeemed. In the run-up to Future Redeemed's release, it was expected to tell a story prior to Xenoblade 3 that doesn't undermine the game's main themes or story beats, tie up any of the remaining loose ends in the main story, and somehow act as the grand finale to the entirety of Xenoblade, all at the same time. It's an obscenely tall order, but Future Redeemed somehow goes above and beyond pulling it off, simultaneously fleshing out each of the numbered Xenoblade games in a way that doesn't undermine their stories, themes, or characters. I really can't stress enough just how insane a feat that is, especially given that the idea to build off Xenoblade 1's self-contained story was seemingly only an idea that came up very late into X's development. And honestly, I could spend hours just gushing over every facet of Future Redeem's story. Despite the main story only clocking in at just over three hours, it's rich with layers and layers of themes that run complementary to the other games. You could easily spend hours reading more into any one part of the game, as many people online have. But in the interest of keeping these ramblings at least a little focused, I'd like to focus on just one of the central themes in Future Redeem that stood out to me the most, that being the relationship between the past, present, and future. Xenoblade 3's story centered on the weight of life, the importance of rejecting stagnancy and embracing change as you move towards the future. Hedonistically wasting away in the here and now is poisonous to your potential and growth as a person, especially at the expense of those around you. Future Redeem supplements this by saying that despite this, it's perfectly valid to have things in the here and now that you love and cherish. It isn't necessary to cast aside the past to change the present, so long as you protect what matters most as you move towards the future. This philosophy is pervasive all throughout the game's main cast, whom embody different aspects of the relationship between those points in time. 
Shulk, Rex, and A embody the past. Nickel and Glimmer symbolize the future. Matthew, N, and Niel represent the present. And of the main cast, I feel it's the latter group that's the one most fascinating to explore the parallels and contrast between. If raw emotion is what affords him strength, it must be disrupted with emotion stronger still. You fail to reach such a zenith. Of the main characters, Matthew, N, and Niel are the ones most directly impacted by the state of the world in which they live. The Endless Now. As the base game established, Anne was driven to despair at the realization that Ionios was cyclical by nature, including his relationship with Mio, fated to end in tragedy time and again. While already a tragic character in Xenoblade 3, Future Redeemed really fleshes Anne out beyond just being that one guy who was cucked to death at the end of the game. As the story of N's fall from grace was originally recounted from Lady M's perspective, she seemingly wasn't privy to the details surrounding N's destruction of the city, namely that the terms for her revival wasn't to merely prove his loyalty by massacring his old home, but to stop Alpha's plans. Plans which hinged entirely upon the people of the city who Alpha saw as his own people. Miel's resurrection as Mobius was just a convenient means for Zed to manipulate Noah for his own personal ends. Destroy Alpha, thereby breaking free from his imprisonment in Origin and preserving the Endless Now. The fresh perspective offered by Future Redeemed frames N's actions at an even more tragic light, as it's shown that his destruction of the city was purely incidental. He clearly never meant to destroy the city, had reservations about killing his possessed granddaughter, and evidently never wanted to kill his own son, Gondor. Nearly all of N's scenes in Future Redeem sees him struggling to bury his mounting grief beneath heaps and heaps of deluded rationalization, but no scene benefits more from these revelations than one scene from the main game, his reunion with Lady M, the first time the two meet face to face again, as she cries out in horror at the atrocities he seemingly committed. Tell me, tell me why! I didn't want to lose any more. What do you mean, any more? Everything we held dear is gone! You took them all away! And you dare talk about your feelings of loss! Anne is paralyzed before the destruction he unwittingly caused. All to destroy Alpha, to maintain the Endless Now, and to create an eternity where he and his Mio could be together. All for his beloved to lash out at him, heartbroken by what he's done. His initial response to M comes off as detached and cold-hearted, but after the events of Future Redeemed, it feels more like an inability to process his decisions and the circumstances that he found himself caught in. Could N have explained to Lady M that he never meant for things to go this far, and that the alternative was to simply let Alpha destroy all of Aeonios? Maybe, but what would that even achieve by this point? Would it bring the citizens back? Would it bring his son back? Would it ease M's grieving heart? The fact is, N was too deep in at this point. Nothing he could have ever said would set things right. Even prior to this moment, N was already an emotional wreck. But it's in this moment, under the weight of Zed's steel and the rigged hand dealt to him, that N is completely and irreversibly broken. N excised both his past and his future to live in the Endless Now. Not necessarily because he wanted to, but because he felt that it was the only option left. He never asked to be handpicked by Zed to slay Alpha, nor did he bargain to bring his meal back to life. But he nonetheless felt that joining Mobius was the only choice available to him. And for as a cruel a choice as it was, he would no doubt do it over and again for the sake of his Mio. It's an unwinnable situation that leaves N a remorseful, self-loathing shell of the man he used to be. And from a certain point of view, Niel really isn't that far removed from Mobius N. Personally, if things could just stay this way, I'd be happy. You serious? If Grandad could hear you, he'd lay you out flat. Born and raised in the city, Niel also forged a strong attachment with the citizens around her, along with and including her brother, Matthew. Unlike with N, her love wasn't bound to any one person, but to the community around her, especially the children of the city, the center of her affections. Unfortunately, the love she felt for the people of the city was so deep that it drove her to despair after witnessing their unjust murders. Not at the hands of Mobius, 
by Kevesi soldiers who hunted them down with glee, the very same type of people that the city was ultimately working to save and bring into their own ranks. Similarly to how N once did, Niall looks at the world she lives in and loses sight of herself. Why should we bother saving people who only know how to kill? Why should we strive to do more than live peacefully with those we love? What's the point of it all when time and again, people always kill people? Matthew, always in fantasy land. What? You can't keep every bloody person happy. How can you not understand it's impossible? The only true end is the moment you give up. Isn't that what Grandad taught us? Then show me already! This world of peace where nobody has to die. Make it come true. You think you could do that, do you? You think you've got what it takes? The small bubble Niall lives in, filled with smiling, happy people, didn't just mean the world to her. It was her world. Even prior to the fall of the Second City, Niall is seemingly unable to see the full scope of what the citizens are working so hard to achieve, of the future they're trying to build together. She doesn't see why that idyllic world should be put at risk for the sake of soldiers engineered to kill without end. Her view of the world, already narrow-minded to begin with, narrows further to the point of hypocrisy, rejecting the notion of recruiting soldiers from the war. She either doesn't believe the Kavesi or Agnian soldiers can change their ways or simply doesn't care at this point, despite many past and present citizens once being soldiers themselves. It's unmistakable that this is an extremely irrational line of thinking, but it's hard to fault Niall when it's also a very realistic and believable reaction to loss. When a person loses something dear to them, it's only natural to search for some sort of explanation for why this happened to find something they can latch onto to make sense of all the pain and sadness. It doesn't matter where that rationalization comes from or even the dark places it takes you. What matters is that you answer the question, why did this have to happen and how do I make it right again? Niall's grief, a direct result of the Endless now, intertwined with her strong attachment to the citizens, makes her the perfect host for Alpha. Not because she bears the power of Ouroboros or is a strong ether user in her own right, but because similarly to N, she was told exactly what she yearned for. The promise of a way not to break the Endless Cycle, but to abandon it entirely. A means to reject the hazy past and the broken present, instead building a new future with the people she cherishes so much. Both N and Niall, beaten and broken by the cruelties of the world around them, heard exactly what they needed to hear what they wanted to hear, and were given an out by powers far greater than them. Both were victims of emotional manipulation, and that Niall happens to be En's own flesh and blood makes it all the more tragic that even these events seem to be cyclical in nature. Though her motives, goals, and philosophy may be different, Niall's actions echo not only those of En, but the very nature of Mobius as a whole. The fear of change and the burning need to change. Two sides of the same coin, forever at odds with one another, yet both just as willing to upend everything for their own short-sighted goals. Which is why Matthew Van Damme stands as such a fantastic contrast between these two extremes. Killing to live? What a load of crap! Good riddance to anything those butchers want to save! They're not things! They're lives! <laughs> and yeah, I can't forgive Mobius either. Reaping lives like Granger in Harvest. But come on. What crimes have their victims ever committed? What did they do? They weren't given a single choice. They were just trying to make the most of each moment, like us. <sighs> On the surface, Matthew is an extremely simple character. His main concerns are finding any missing citizens, including Niel, and restoring the city back to its former glory. Of course, his approach to doing so is extremely straightforward to the point of being reckless. In a way, what you see is what you get with Matthew, but that's also part of his charm. He's an extremely honest and upfront guy. And yet, that affable personality belies something much deeper. Despite losing everything, his home, his grandfather, and potentially his sister, Matthew never gives up on his goal to rebuild the city. In spite of the tragedy that befell him and everything he witnesses along the way, at no point does he ever lose sight of his goal. Build the future together. 
not just with his fellow citizens, but alongside any Keves or Agnian soldiers willing to change. This nearly unshakable will to persist in spite of life's countless misfortunes and setbacks is one of Matthew's most defining traits. He clearly doesn't see the point in letting past grief hold him back or wallowing in the present. While he's certainly not without his faults, he'd sooner put himself on the line to lift up others than to be brought down himself. This is most apparent not in the main story, but across the various side quests in Future Redeemed, showcasing Matthew's innate sense of leadership, charisma, and thoughtfulness. Though he doesn't think much of it all. To Matthew, it's just another day in trying to rebuild and ensure the future together. But at the end of the day, Matthew is only human, and even he has his own doubts and fears. He doesn't have some grand, all-encompassing vision of what the world could be, putting his ideals at odds with Niel, who can't bear to live in a world predicated on senseless violence. He may know what to do, but he doesn't always know what to say, least of all how to ease Niel's pain. That small seed of grief blossoms into doubt when Matthew finally sees Niel again, Doubt just strong enough for Alpha to try drawing out later on, in a last-ditch effort to coerce Matthew over to his side. You have done nothing wrong. You simply strode forth towards the future. But the olden humans, they did not find value in it. You must have realized, this is not where you belong. Stop! Why make a martyr of yourself? Why be a stepping stone? For as long as the old is not excised, mankind has no future. Alpha plays to Matthew's emotions, just as what happened to both N and Niel before him. Unlike N and Niel, it's Matthew's love for the city, his firm belief in the best of humanity as a whole, and his undying devotion to rebuild the future that empowers him in the face of such doubt. Even though N did eventually show up to bail Matthew out of the situation, at no point did Matthew ever humor Alpha's rhetoric, nor did he willingly yield to him. And sure, it's debatable whether Matthew would have relented with or without N's intervention, that timely intervention arguably only happens because Matthew previously saw through the front N put on, completely disowning him for throwing his own past away. It should speak volumes that, following a failed attempt to rationalize his own actions again, N's only response to Matthew is a defeated, empty silence. By the end of the game, Matthew doesn't excuse the actions of Niel or N, of Alpha and Mobius, but neither does he dwell on them. Build a better future together. Day by day, step by step. That's what matters most to him, which makes the bittersweet end to his story. Walking off into Ionios, never to be seen again, hit all the harder. In a sense, it also serves as one of many thematic bookends to Xenoblade 1. All life, walking towards the future, hand in hand. Future Redeemed is far from the only game in the series with this theme. It's ever recurring, as with many other themes and archetypes in the series. Even the recurrence of these themes and motifs in and of themselves is a recurring theme, with endless contrasts and parallels between dozens of characters and events spanning generations, all telling the same story of humanity's endless follies. Future Redeemed not only embraces these themes all the same, but communicates them so effectively through its cast of characters that I still can't stop thinking about it, even after having moved on to other games. Like I said before, I could gush about Future Redeemed for hours. This isn't so much of a character study as it is an excuse to gush about just one part of the game that thoroughly impressed me. I'm not going to be able to keep this short and still cover everything else I like, so to round this video out, here's a few other quick thoughts of mine. Shulk and Rex are both expertly written, with their interactions between Nickel and Glimmer highlighting just how the years after their adventures have affected them. It would have been easy to portray the two men as disillusioned and jaded at their origin's failure, but they end up feeling very true to their original portrayals, having matured in an extremely believable fashion. Personally, it's actually a little surreal to see, having basically grown up alongside these characters in real time. Nicole and Glimmer add another dimension to the existing kavesi agnian conflict and have a believable amount of growth across the game, which is impressive given just how incidental their introduction to the story even is. And of course, there's A, who somehow fleshes out Alvis's character and even has some insanely good chemistry with Matthew on top of that. In other words, A is absolutely phenomenal. 
As always, the world building is expansive and excellent, with some of the most meaningful side content in the series yet, to the point I'd argue it's actually mandatory just because of how much it adds. And of course, there's also the entirety of Chapter 5, which is just an extremely fulfilling moment for longtime fans who've been with the series since Xenogears and Xenosaga. And much like those games, the sheer depth of topics to explore and analyze in Future Redeemed is downright oceanic. Future Redeemed doesn't answer every hanging question left by the base game, but for the most part, it introduces enough new information that there's still plenty of room open for interpretation and discussion well until the next entry is announced. Having been with the series since the early Xenoblade 1 days, seeing the way Future Redeemed plays off the other Xenoblade entries feels rightfully earned. None of the major story beats ever feel written with the idea of having people clap just because of some obligatory popcorn moment that happened. The end result is a once-in-a-lifetime story predicated upon years and years of in-game and developmental history that only grows more rewarding the more you dig into the series. So, in case you're wondering, did I really make this video as an outlet for a bunch of repressed opinions that I can't share on Twitter without spoiling others? Yeah, yeah, pretty much actually, yeah. The biggest takeaway from all of this is that if Future Redeemed also resonated this heavily with you, then this is the best time to play Xenogears and Xenosaga if you haven't already. Not only will an understanding of their stories and internal rules add more to your enjoyment of Xenoblade as a whole, but they're all fantastic experiences in their own right, with memorable characters, intricate stories, and a staggering amount of world building. While not without their own compromises and shortcomings, these games have more than enough heart to make up for their rough edges. Unfortunately, none of these games have been re-released in the past decade, so they're not exactly accessible. So skip out on paying the scalper toll and instead look for the undubbed and uncensored version of the games, which are currently the best ways to experience Xenogears and Xenosaga. Of course, if modern ports of these games ever get announced, then you should absolutely support those releases if the time comes. Unless they're bad ports with bugs and performance issues that the original games didn't have, in which case you just gotta get that weak-ass nonsense out of here. FUCK THIS GAME! 